Okay, unser nächster Speaker ist Leonard Dobusch. Um, Our next speaker is Leonard Dobusch. Most of you will know him because he blogs at uh, Netzpolitik. He's also a professor at the University of Innsbruck. But the reason why he's here today is that he is a member of the German television broadcasting board. Welcome, Leonard. Thank you for inviting me here. And I must say I'm very happy that so many of you came. I wasn't sure if a talk about uh, broadcasting and broadcasting councils would still uh, pass as being nerdy, but um, let's dive straight into it. I would like to start with the question that I asked myself when I was um, asked if I would like to be nominated for the broadcasting board. What is a broadcasting board and what does it do? I admit that I wasn't quite sure of it, sure about that myself. I had some idea of it having to do with broadcasting and television. And if you uh, look at the website of this broadcasting board of the second German TV channel, they say that it's, um, it represents the interests of viewers and it's about no more or less than the interests of the society at large, of representing the interests of society at large towards the uh, TV channel. And um, if you consider how much uh, the uh, second German television channel earns in license fees every month, it's uh, a bit less than five euros from each of you. That's uh, an important uh, job. And uh, it, uh, this board elects the, um, the chief uh, executive officer, but um, they elected every five years and was elected the year before I joined the board. And it elects eight out of 12 members of uh, the uh, administrative board of the TV channel. The board meets four to five times a year in uh, a plenary session, usually in Mainz or Berlin. But even though these uh, sessions are public, I don't want to invite you to them because it's not really very interesting. You could say that they're heavily scripted. Most deals are done in, in advance. And um, the session has to end by 12.30 for a press conference, but uh, more on that later. You're not allowed to take photos there, just like you're not on how to do it at this Congress, which is a bit strange because it's a public service broadcasting. But uh, I took uh, an illegal photo here, that um, so please don't share it without uh, consulting your lawyer. But why is there chaos in the uh, in this uh, in this board, which of course has a double meaning? Why? Um, is, why is a member of the Chaos Computer Club, has, why have, has a member of the CCC been nominated for this? But also, why, why is that important? Why, why does it matter what uh, a body like this does, that, a body that many of you may never have heard of before? It all started with an argument about uh, this uh, person here, who um, was uh, editor-in-chief in 2010, and his contract was uh, not, pr not renewed after pressure from the German Conservative Party. 
and um, you, you can see that this has been relevant when you see that people have uh, written PhD theses about this. His name is uh, Nicolas Brenner. And this thesis was written because somebody sued in front of the German Constitutional Court. And two years later, there, um, there came the ruling that the second German television had not uh, done its job in uh, limiting the number of representatives close to the government. So, for example, people who, who are nominated by parties or... And in the old board in 2016, that was more than two third. Two thirds, it was then limited to one third. So it, it was allowed to be less than a third. It could never be more than a third. So exactly. So of course, um, they made sure it was exactly a third. Twenty of the sixty of these are directly nominated by the state, but forty of them are not immediately, not directly nominated by by the state. So um, they had to fill this board. And uh, many of you know that um, this is a federal matter in Germany, so each of the German states was uh, allowed to nominate one person for one specific subject. And uh, this means that we have 16 representatives from uh, these uh, subjects. Bavaria, of course. Bavaria picked uh, the subjects of digital matters. And um, gave it uh, to to uh, telecom lobbyists. Berlin, on the other hand, picked internet. There is now a representative from the internet area and he's being sent from uh, he's being sent by the federal state of Berlin and um, gave this to four associations the chaos communication club the d64 close to the socialist party ECO and media.net Berlin Brandenburg which is a which uh, is a club I didn't I had never heard of before and these four associations <laughs> agreed um, for some weird reason on sending a, an Austrian. Uh, my first question was, I'm, I'm Austrian, are you allowed to nominate me? And um, they um, found out that if it's not explicitly forbidden, it must be allowed. And uh, that means that since July 2016, I'm allowed to uh, represent the internet in the Broadcasting Council. How am I trying to um, to do this? Mostly I'm uh, putting uh, a lot of what I do online and I don't want to exaggerate my role here. I'm one of 60 in this body but um, simply tweeting and blogging at Netzpolitik is something that already irritates a lot of people. I try to uh, attend a lot of conferences like Re Republica and uh, this conference and uh, give talks. So that's why um, the internet is part of the Broadcasting Council, but Broadcasting Board. But uh, there was another reason for this. People said if if there's this um, this governing body here, or this observing body, which has a different name um, and, and different makeup in, in other broadcasts, other public service broadcasters, and this ruling from the Constitutional Court 
said that legislators must ensure a minimum amount of transparency, and I thought that was the, the way they um, they argued here is quite nice, because it can. They said that it can prevent misuse of power and uh, misuse of particular interests. And this uh, minimum amount of, of uh, transparency will be interesting later. But uh, this meant that I uh, now um, fly regularly to Mainz and uh, Berlin. And there are two main points here. Two main topics I try to uh, work with. I've, I've tried to work with for two years now, and uh, I want to increase transparency in this uh, governing body. And uh, this minimum amount is probably not enough. And uh, secondly, I want to help answer the question of how public service broadcasters, public service media have to work online to in order to remain relevant in the long term because i think it makes sense that there are public service media that on the internet that um, are working competition to profit driven companies and these public service media could potentially play that role but I don't believe that they do so today. And I think there's a lot of work yet to be done. And I want to uh, to uh, help with that. And I think these two subjects are connected. If public service media want to remain relevant, they also need to, need to uh, be anchored in society in a way that's credible. To um, prevent people claiming that uh, these uh, media are too close or too far from society, uh, too close to politics or too far from society. And these are the two subjects that I want to uh, talk about in this talk. So let me start with the transparency. It, it is um, adequate for the title. What does it mean to have a minimum of transparency? We first need to look at what a minimal measure of transparency could look like. So any change to the policy of the uh, of the session is something that should be documented. So, so the the sessions are not normally public, and that's an improvement over it's never non-public. So there can be exceptions to make it public. So my experience isn't that it, that they have uh, gone out of bounds and gone crazy on it uh, on, the, on their openness, but from my perspective, this means that now it is uh, not impossible to have make an exception and and open it up. So this. So the secrecy topic is. Uh, is very uh, delicate, and they they take it very seriously. So, I got a letter from the from the head of the session, and there are new communication channels, and she wants me to sign a a secrecy agreement. So I'm, uh, every year I need to sign a non-disclosure agreement, and I have to fax it back. <laughs> so 
so in my office, I couldn't use the fax machine, so I sent a scan. But the interesting thing is the the justification that they use. So they are saying that it cannot be discussed freely if it is more open. And I believe to some degree that may even be true. Some of the sub sessions are more open. So being able to, to talk to them in confidence allows more openness. So the the official sessions are public. So people are allowed to, allowed to come to uh, Mainz and, and, and join in person. But it and and before the uh, the big session in Mainz, there's a, a lot of proposals. So here's the here's the proposals, and 24 of them were secret, and five of them have been accessible publicly anyway. So this uh, this means that the that the participants in the session refer to documents that that are secret and they refer to it in a in a public session. But they are very serious about the secrecy. So I took the um the proposal on uh, youth and uh, and offerings for the youth and and I publicized this in a in a blog entry in netspolitik.org before the session and I immediately got a letter from uh, from uh, the head of the session Actually, it was an exchange um, of, of multiple messages, and and she asked me to remove that link. So she was afraid of a. She was justifying her request um, with the with the freedom to discuss it freely, and she doesn't want to have it prejudged in the public opinion. And and, and uh, he agrees. Uh, he agrees that um, he, he, he needs the interested public so the <laughs> The interested public is, is never as big as uh, the audience in this room, and I and he needs to discuss with the uh, interested public in order to form an opinion. And the justification that if the sessions were more public, then uh, then the proposals would be even less content for. And I can understand that from the perspective of of the uh, television station to to send out sixty copies of those means that uh, it does reach a journalist if there's something cross inside it. But so it, it almost is public. So the question is, what what can one do? So if I want to comply with the um, house order, <laughs> I have reflected on my competencies as a professor, and I started reading this word for word uh, so that I was able to tweet about it afterwards. 
Now, whether this the hack is the is the adequate way of dealing with this, I, I, I'm put into question. But uh, my opinion is that uh, a minimum measure of transparency is is not achieved with the uh, with the current procedures. So some people might think that this is boring. But when I read about it in the media, then there was a different topic. So so the problem is, uh, the problem always being discussed is the, the circles of friends. And my question is, um, are those circles of friends not the, the real problem to transparency? So these I informal circles of friends were the reason for the decision from the um, uh, from the court. So the justification from the from the court um, says that uh, the party communication structures are too strong and uh, and they are being expressed in those circles of friends and and this is why transparency is necessary so when i join or when anybody joins um, this session there are two types of circles of friends and you have to decide which one you want to belong to So during the <laughs> during the first uh, session, <laughs> there was a reception, and uh, um, starters were uh, served, and and I got invitations to to both of those circles. So the left one is uh, from a former defense minister, and the right one is. From a from a red uh, uh, workers' union uh, politician, so you you're part of that circle that that you attend, and they happen at the same time. So it has nothing to do with uh, with friends. It's it's uh, simply a. a a party function, and and this is the the election of the uh, executive committee here. So these are simply um, political meetings, and I joke about this because it is a bit funny, but it's it is not it's not just absurd. It's not only absurd. Uh, some. Uh, one thing that I liked is that um, these elections, which are done properly, in secret and uh, with a ballot. So it's a bit too easy to just say this is silly. It's naive to think that um, a committee as large as this doesn't, doesn't uh, reach agreements in advance. Of course they do. And these circles of friends mean that they help to formalize this a bit. And at least for those who are within these circles, it establishes uh, transparency a bit. And for those on the outside, I blog. And um, in the second German TV channel, these uh, friends of circles have advantages as well. There are people who test the limits of, uh, of these. And a professor or friend of mine was part of the West German TV channel's um, um, supervisory board. 
he was a member of the Pirate Party, and um, no party, no other party really uh, wanted him. So he 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 didn't really have any uh, any formal friends. This wouldn't have happened in the second German TV channel. He would simply have joined one of these circles, and that would have been that. Another thing that's uh, important uh, to me as somebody who blogs a lot is that uh, an informal board such as this can't have any formal uh, non-disclosure agreements. So I can uh, blog about this if I can live with the social con consequences. This was one of my first blog posts. And as I mentioned earlier, these boards have to determine uh, some of the uh, administrative boards, and of course, four of those go to the eight, four of those go to the largest parties, and uh, the conservative circle of friends had five candidates that wasn't planned so um, they sat until there were only four and um, the the socialist uh, circle of friend friends had actual can candidates running for election and um, it took uh, three elections to fill all the places to fill all the seats and I could blog about this because there is nothing um, nothing preventing me there's nothing formally prohibiting it and uh, the same thing happened when uh, these circles of friends elected uh, the supervisory board of Arte and the most democratic elections were actually conducted in these circles of friends and I have to say that if I if I um, object to something here, I couldn't I couldn't take part in these elections. But if I don't, I can actually blog about it, and I would actually like to um, live stream these elections last uh, the next time. But I wonder why we can't add a new paragraph into into. Uh, the regulations where we actually for build form construct formal factions and um, those would hopefully not necessarily delineate along the same lights lines as they do in uh, in uh, in the federal parliament but the very term circle of friends is uh, not dignified for a, for a board such as this uh, supervisory board. Why not call something factions if it is a faction practice? And my experience with these pre-elections was that some members who represent social groups and groups of society have a very uh, strong party affiliation and to change this we would have to have a certain share of representatives who are assigned randomly who are assigned randomly from those who uh, pay the license fees And that would make it more difficult to uh, to get party majorities. There's one last thing I would like to mention. I've been talking about distancing this body from the state for for quite a while. But. I think you don't have to distance them from the state. From the state, you also have to distance yourself from the from the TV channel itself, and that's uh, another thing we struggle with. 
something that we struggle with a lot is um, is complaints. You can send a complaint if there's something you object to, but for your complaint to for your complaint to uh, to be discussed in this uh, in these board meetings, you have to complain a second time. And when you've done that, it will be discussed. But the <laughs> the likelihood of it ending in anything other than a rejection is zero. This is a statistic I compiled from the two years I've been uh, a member of this board. We discussed 43, um, 43 complaints and uh, 41 of them were were would ended in uh, this uh, this template text and two of them had a slightly more customized reply but it nobody none of them ended in in agreements and i don't really know what happens if if there is an agreement if hell freezes freezes over or heads roll i don't think anybody really knows because i don't think it's ever happened and this the the point that is made is that um, even reject even though these are rejected questions are still being asked uh, and I can I can imagine that it's not not great for those involved but the optics of rejecting all complaints simply aren't great and it's maybe something we should um, reconsider. I've talked a lot about uh, supervisory uh, su supervision but something I would I find far more important is the future of public service uh, media online where the where transparency certainly can uh, contribute, but it, it's about far more than that. What can public service broadcasters accomplish under the new conditions? One of the first things you might uh, you might think of are these uh, is uh, web TV, where. Stefan Stuckmann uh, wrote uh, wrote a horror wrote of horrid trips. Uh, I would like to, to to their defense, public service broadcasters struggle have have far more to do than simply Netflix because they also have sport have sports to deal with. They also have. Um, have uh, culture and um, the first uh, TV channel has uh, has in fact uh, 12 of these um, of these uh, watch it later libraries and that makes it a bit less surprising that there's a call for for integrating these all into one, but there's there's actually a call for merging even the private uh, broadcasting companies into into uh, into one giant library. But if this is a problem if one of the most important things is that these are distinguishable, uh, that public service broadcasters are distinguishable from uh, private companies that are profit driven. The second uh, German TV company has just one library and uh, It doesn't really um, consider the cross-media implications either. Uh, 
and uh, the CEO, Thomas Bellut, said that uh, the second, uh, the, the, his TV channel online is still essentially a TV channel, but there are no TV channels on the internet. If you want to build it on an online TV channel, you're going to lose. Somebody who um, understood this a bit better is the BBC, and it's not. It's not. Uh, it often happens that uh, the BBC is the shining example here. And there was a consensus that uh, the BBC has to be an open, con uh, an open platform for content. And this could go as far as allowing uh, users to submit their own content. And this is a fundamental thing to understand. If I'm interested in creating a digital public sphere, we have to have open platforms. How, how, can, how can public spheres exist in the digital world? And uh, these are shaped by, um, these are more and more mediated by digital platforms. That's, what do I mean by low level pub public uh, publishing activities, it's blogs, but it's also the streaming offers from uh, the Chaos Computer Club. But all of these, all of these offerings have to have to pass the bottleneck of digital platforms, and that's mainly YouTube and Facebook. And this is something that uh, even uh, public service broadcasting companies have understood. It, I'd say it, it happened mainly by accident, but it was a very productive accident, that uh, when uh, they discovered that viewers are becoming older and older, and the idea was to uh, create a, a youth channel. But channels are really expensive. And at some point, people understood that young people don't really watch linear TV anyway. Maybe we should uh, create something that simply broadcasts online. It now exists. It's uh, called Funk. Most of you are no longer in its target, target group. And it has one huge advantage to all other public service offerings. It had never, it was never part of a TV channel. There's no legacy problem. So, from the very beginning, they could uh, orientate themselves to a platform. Uh, so they um, built a multi-channel network on on YouTube, and they they're not unsuccessful with that. But in order to allow this, we had to change broadcasting law and we inserted a paragraph on how long they can, uh, how long things can remain online before you have to depublicize, depublish them, unpublish them. And uh, the consensus was to that we had to. Uh, consider the interests of young people. But why is that why is that true only for the uh, for the youth channel and not the existing channels as well? And why does it not cover the remaining um, public offerings? The Germans are present on these platforms, <coughs> but they are um, subjugated uh, to the law to depublicize. So if you look at the platform strategy of the uh, second uh, channel, the ZDF, this is from the strategy paper and reach can be achieved by being present on as many platforms as possible 
mainly the big ones, YouTube, Facebook, Netflix, Amazon Video. And this means not only in, in their own media platform, but um, also publication in those third plat platforms, in those commercial platforms. So I don't I don't disagree with it, but but I I don't see how it uh, increases the value. I can I can. But I I agree that no YouTube is is no solution either. But there are there are other platforms. And they are not mentioned in here. So Wikipedia is not mentioned. And they all visit that. And especially the youth that, uh, that we are uh, so keen to reach. According to their own study, 95% of the youth do use Wikipedia. So the reach is good on there, but it is. I, I would find it a better fit, and I, I find it a great omission. So Wikipedia has has mostly text, and it has few movies. And here at the television, there's mainly moving pictures, and there's no text without reference to some broadcast. And that has not been changed. So on the one side, there's only text and, and no moving images, and on the other side, there's only moving images. So I think it's a... It's a match made in heaven. Both of them are oriented towards quality and public service. Especially when you look at encyclopedic content. So I've, I've shown this at the Republica conference and and I have been most notable in the in the public sessions with this topic so the 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 public premium has found that uh, they can use this to to counter fake news So they have always been they've always been accused of <laughs> being able to publicize anything. So Wikipedia has addressed fake news right from the start and there are robust ways of depending on topic to avert the worst. Now, the, the the public media, how much do they spend? So I I pose the question: Why do we want to be on the commercial platforms but not in Wikipedia? And and the answer was: We have to set priorities. And and then I answered <coughs> that that is what I agree. We have to set priorities. So you're paying for commercial platforms, and I want to set, set um, different priorities. So this is how much they're spending on it. Wikipedia has actually published a wish list on what they would like to have. 
So um, explain pieces, historical pieces, documentaries, um, documentations of uh, uh, elections, um, standing images, uh, info pictures, uh, commentaries, and uh, self-productions. Wikipedia doesn't want fiction. Uh, Wikipedia doesn't want uh, game on music. Um, that, that's uh, and and Wikipedia doesn't want any material from the agencies. So in Wikipedia, there's a an open license. So on Wikipedia. People are permitted to share without having to ask. So these are the, the requirements for Wikipedia compliance. This must be permitted. And that means that our television stations have a ch are challenged with this. So they so they they wouldn't have a problem with this on many things so this has been published so what i'm doing here is um, i'm violating this license why does the television station have such a problem with Creative Commons? Why do they find it so difficult? I think that um, public content is uh, a part of the um, C3 mantra to publish public data and uh, to protect private data. So my opinion is um, it, it would be worthwhile to invest in this endeavor. After two, two and a half years of discussion, I, I, keep, I still keep repeating this, and uh, there's fear of manipulation. Naturally, a restrictive license does not exclude a, a use by third parties, and it is different whether this is happening with our permission or without. They are, they are afraid that their material is going to be abused. And the problem is that there's many rights owners so here's an example of a film that was published under creative commons license so this is not compatible to wikipedia so here's here's a fiction example that 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 wouldn't be wouldn't go into Wikipedia. Wikipedia wants something simpler. It wants um, their own creations um, on facts. Another problem that they have is how to how to pay for it. Who gets who gets paid? So there's um, repeat payments and uh, and time limited usages and. And there's um, um, free participants or, or, or freelancers, and they are being paid very little for the first time, and uh, they profit from repeat showings, and that wouldn't work with Wikipedia anymore. So we we do have three reasons that uh, increase the cost.
but I think it is important to demand that this is a worthwhile investment. And they would, uh, I'm, I'm convinced they would, they would uh, bring benefit to the public. For a long time, I tried to to beg for it. But it, is, uh, it has been a learning with myself, and now I've become more offensive and, and more... So so this was at uh, Republica. We even had... Uh, they, they had uh, virtual reality at, uh, at that conference. So they're in investing in History 360, when, uh, where historic buildings are built and, and you can walk through them and you can see see them from the inside. And it's been presented to him. And I, I just uh, try to avoid being photographed with it. And then the people who made it came to him and uh, and said, we don't know how to how to bring it to the public and his uh, my answer was that um, this is a historical documentation documentary and, and i have an idea here and i asked whether they had all rights and and there are no rights that aren't with them So I believe in 10 years they will be begging Wikipedia to include their content because they are becoming irrelevant themselves. And now we come to the last part of my talk. It is important for me to, to get the permission to publish them in Wikipedia. Because uh, this this frame of mind of the Wikipedia licenses that that would be the test whether the uh, the stations are ready for going to, towards these um, public digital spaces. So these public open spaces are something that arises from the cooperation of these different platforms. And I can see that uh, the public media could be a part of this. They could be cooperating with the other ones. So ZDF is starting with a, with a cultural platform to, to reach out to the non-commercial models. It could mean to to be a, uh, an amplifier for for blogs and other non-commercial uh, uh, amateur publications, and it could mean that uh, there's investment into uh, public good. I don't think these these people are are evil. Um, I just think that. These, these new requirements are overtaxing them. They have, they have always been busy with what they've been doing and, and they're busy with it today. And now to say that they should be doing everything that they've been doing in the past and then in addition they, they should take on this, that's, that's asking a bit much. This is why I think it needs something new, just like Funk which we've seen earlier. So I've given it a name that sounds vaguely like uh, what we had before, Internet Intendance. And I would think that this should be focused on uh, the new requirements. It should be, it should be funded with 10 times the amount of 
um, of the of the children's program funk five percent about a third should be amateurs and I think that they that it should have two tasks it should be an open source platform it should uh, attribute cash It should um, attribute cash to um, public goods innovations, and it, and the third task should be to be a librarian and an archivist and uh, curator for non-commercial and uh, and blogs. And if this new if this new function were to fulfill these three tasks. Then we can have something that is public internet or public public media, internet media, or something. So you can uh, find my content, uh, my comments on uh, Twitter under this hashtag Fernsehrat, and you can read uh, my blog on netspolitics.org. We have five more minutes for questions, and um, I will be happy to take them. We have exactly five minutes for questions. Thank you, Leonard. So if you think you have a question that you can answer in a, a single sentence with a question mark at the end, please line up at one of the microphones. Thank you for your talk. I was wondering what prevented you from uh, joining uh, both of these uh, friends, uh, circles of friends. Well, they um, co very coincident, most coincidentally, they um, always meet at the same time. But there are groups of these circles of friends that, uh, that talk to each other. So I am um, know what uh, the competing circle of friends uh, has been talking about not in detail but uh, still but the main question is if you want to continue with uh, these two separate circles the internet has a question as well the internet wonders if you as a, a license fee payer can influence this process because there's not really much leverage you have with the supervisory board. That's a great question. It's incredible how unusual public attention is for the members of these boards. For example, the fact that they get five complaints from the ultra-wide wing uh, AFD makes them wonder if they've been uh, re reporting fairly for the last 20, 30 years. But that's something they, uh, they these people abuse because five because um, a few people getting involved would make a huge difference. I would like to ask about complaints what do you think what percentage of complaints is justify justified how much is trolling how much are mis misunderstandings i'm not part of the complaints board I, I mean i have been following this but my impression is that the majority of complaints is tends to be uh, driven by party party politics and party interests, Russian conspiracy. They're not very helpful. But the fact that no complaint ever has been uh, admitted is, 
is just it sounds so unlikely and you have to have to find a mode of operation that doesn't have such horrible optics I would like to know what the background what the reason for all this secrecy might be is there a reasonable explanation or do they simply not want things to be discussed publicly well this is pure speculation but even in these circles of friends well if everything was being debated there that would be great but that's not that's not even what happens there's a small very small circle of people that essentially does everything i would uh, i f- i would say that the more number of people who notice this the more difficult it gets to uh, central figures to decide things on their own but the non publicity of these meetings means that things can be discussed much more openly behind closed doors that that, that couldn't be discussed otherwise that's all we have time for unfortunately even though uh, even though but you you're here for another three days and uh, a huge applause for Leonor Leonard please and uh, thank you for listening to this translation if you have any feedback at all please do leave it at 